Hello, I'm Rosemary Lott from ABEARS. Uh, I wondered, uh, probably anyone in, of the three in the panel could answer this. What's your sense of the capacity of farmers to continue to adapt in the future as climate continues to throw increased variability and in uh, decreased rainfall and increased temperature at us? Sorry, I can't see you, so is this... <laughs> yeah, OK. <laughs> um, well, it, it, it seems that farmers are adapting at a rate of around 25 kilograms per hectare per year, uh, but there is a ceiling to that, and, and that ceiling is that they will reach 80% of yield potential. So you've got one trend, which is the, the rising... Um, capacity, if you like, of farmers to, to make the most of what's happening, that will come to a plateau when it reaches 80%. There's literature from lots of places around the world that, that supports that, including from Australia. Um, at the same time, what we don't know is if there is a ceiling on how much the climate will become more adverse. If it continues at the current rate, and that's an if, because I don't think anyone would be brave enough to say whether it will or it won't. In terms of climate change projections, that rate is actually at the more negative side of predictions. Uh, but if it does continue, then uh, in the next 26 years, we will have crossed the line and we will be seeing reductions in, in, in yields. So that, that, that means when you get to that point, it doesn't matter how hard you try, that's it. You're going, you're going backwards whether you like it or not. Un unless prices go dramatically higher and there's no, none of the economists are predicting that. Mm -hmm. Neil, the, the, the new model that you were showing us, obviously that is a, 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 tr a tremendous step up. Um, is, is that fully operational now? Mm -hmm. And what else is in the pipeline if you're doing stuff that is, is that impressive? Um, and is already being used, what else is coming to? Yeah, uh, th th thanks Lee. We, um, it's not operational right now. We'd expect to get it operational later this, this year. That's, right. the, uh, th th that's the hope. Um, so the early signs is a, is a show of positive there. Um, we're seeing some improvement. We, expect, uh, we ex uh, expect improvements, but there's got to be some management of expectations around, around here. There's still uncertainties, you know, the probabilities, um, we're not going to get to the 90%, we, we're getting to the 80% in some, uh, some areas. Um, but the, the, the next lot is really taking the, this model from the UK and just tweaking it slightly um, for Australia, so that's what will come out this year. And then there'll be a lot more tailoring or Australianising of the model in future, uh, future years, and, and, I, and I think we'll see, we'll, we'll see some uh, better improvements improvements there and then beyond that it is you know how how can we continue to um, um, improve our supercomputing our science the modeling and, and, and so forth um, but there's a lot of advancements going on around the world so I expect that improvement to progress for a good few years yet Great. Now another question here, and please don't hesitate to put your hand up. It's, it's actually quite difficult to see you with the, the bright lights, so you may need to sort of wave your hand around a little bit. But a question over here. That's on. Uh, David Campbell, uh, Agribusiness Freelance. T two questions, they're related, and they are linked to the earlier question about farmers adapting. So firstly to, to Z, um, the focus on yield potential, have you been able to discern whether there's been a significant change in water use efficiency underpinning what you're seeing? Because uh, it would, would seem to suggest that that is, is happening. Um, I'm not sure whether you factored in what was going on with genetic potential and whether you've been able to take that out. Um, so that's my first question. And the second one is, is to Neil Hughes. Um, there seems to be a lag effect between when we introduce new technology and farmers learn to use it and their advisors learn to use it and work in with variability. Um, and from the commercial side of, of input industries, I certainly saw that over about a 30 year period in our commercial experience. Have you been able to factor that in at all in, in somehow in your analysis? And if so, does it give us some insights about how we actually improve 
the speed and rate of adoption, which has been one of the underlying issues in extension uh, traditionally in agriculture, is how do we get these innovations, both rate and speed, much more into agriculture? Thank you. Two good questions. Uh, Sveen, we might go to you firstly with the yield potential one. Uh, so the first half of that, uh, water use efficiency, yes. The answer is yes. Uh, the, the, the two are almost inseparable. Uh, in terms of separating the genetic effect, I have no update on that, but other work suggests that that's about half of the progress that we see in, in technological improvement. Um, so you, you have kind of system improvements, you have genetic improvement. The two often uh, leverage each other. And, uh, and, and so even distinguishing between them is, is a bit fallacious, but certainly uh, yeah, the, the assumption would be that genetic improvement's about half of that story. And the second one, Neil? Yeah, so um, the idea that there are lags between uh, research development uh, extension uh, is something that ABES has looked at in a lot of its research. It's not something that is explicitly uh, built in, into to the model in this study. Um, but certainly um, the idea that there are lags between the productivity growth that you see in the model, so that the rebound over the last 10 years and uh, uh, the research and development activities that led to that. So you know, it, it suggests that there was a period where productivity was stagnant. So presumably there was a lot of activity going on during that period, but it may not have taken effect and, until later. So, um, yeah. Now, right up the back. Uh, Jim Prattley, Charles Sturt University. Uh, Neil, I was wondering whether you could just it's Neil. give us the numbers on the improvement from what we have now to what the new model will give in terms of accuracy or confidence from what to what? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we, we don't have the numbers just, just yet, we're not likely to have for a while, but um, it's a bit of a blunt measure to put a single um, n number on, on this and uh, yeah, just to explain, explain why. And we, and we track this, so we track the accuracy across Australia, which in in one way, it's a, it's a measure of how well the model's gone, but in another, it's, a, it, it's blunt. It doesn't actually mean, mean anything, because what's important is how well we're forecasting at certain areas of Australia and at certain times of the, of the year. Um, so we know that that blunt measure, the national measure, um, is a lot lower than when you unpack it for, uh, for, key, uh, for key areas. Um, and it's also, um, it's also more important is that when you're getting extremes in the climate and they're impacting on rainfall and temperature in extreme ways, that you forecast them events better. And we know that these models do that, so that when we've got an El Nino, La Nina, or things happening in the Indian Ocean, we've got more confidence um, in, in, in those models. Uh, get back to your original question, though. We're, we're targeting national average 10% increase. Um, but that will... Um, uh, that will have more impact when you look regionally and, and certain times of the year. 10% on what? Uh, well, whether well, it's between 60 and 70% now, you know, sort of 65 is, um, um, uh, percent. Um, again, it does, it, it's a bit meaningless in, in, in itself, the actual improvements. Um, that understates the improvements um, that we're likely to make uh, for the reasons I just, I just gave. And, and Zvi, this, uh, this, this past year has been quite extraordinary. Um, clearly it's a case of add water it will grow. <laughs> um, but is it, would, from the research you've done, would it appear to you, given the trends that you were showing us, that it really is just kind of one of those one-off events? Or years? Well, I, I wouldn't say one-off, um, but I'd be surprised if we get say more than three of those in the next 26 years. Right. <laughs> so don't hold your breath waiting for that. Um, already we're hearing from Neil that perhaps we're moving into a La, uh, El Nino event, uh, mm. which doesn't necessarily mean high, uh, low yields, but um, yeah, it, it, it was an exceptional year and there's no reason to think we're likely to repeat it too often into the future just as we wouldn't have, even if there was no climate change. 
That wasn't what I was hoping you were going to say. <laughs> um, Neil, though, um, the, given the exceptional year, from a layman's perspective, it, it kind of looked like a lot of tropical activity was really responsible for the totals that we saw and ultimately the season that, that we've had. Um, the, the predictions have all been about hotter and drier, but if, you know, if oceans are warming, if the Indian Ocean was such a big driver for this past period, is there a possibility that we could see wetter summers in future and, and, and more of this kind of thing, in your opinion? Yeah, well, certainly, um, you know, some of the extremes and, and un unpacking this one with, um, um, with that shift in the Indian in, you know, Ocean, that, that was unprecedented. So we don't, have a, we don't really have a historical analog no. to, uh, to see how that impacts on climate. But um, we know from the models that there's likely to be higher, higher rainfall um, you know, places a lot like Tasmania um, during winter, uh, the flooding, the high rainfall they were getting was subtropical -trop rainfall. It wasn't winter, uh, win winter rainfall. Uh, so we're seeing lots of unusual, um, un unusual things happen. Um, I agree with um, uh, Zvi there. Um, the last 20, the last 20 years above average rainfall over south southeast is about four, three, three or four. 16 have mm -hmm. been. Uh, below average, that fits with the um, atmospheric circulation changes um, we've sp uh, spoken about. Um, so I'd say, yes, we're still going to get these wet uh, events, uh, but, the, but they're uh, unlikely to be as, more f as frequent as what we've had in the past. Okay. Any other questions? Quite an extraordinary year it was. Well, if that's the case, uh, we're, oh no, I beg your pardon, one more over this side of the room. Sue Besto from the Department of Agriculture. Um, you've spoken about how farmers have started to adapt to climate change over the last 20, 25 years. What you describe is incremental change. When do you think we're going to see transformational change? Well, I think the thing about transformational change is that it, it doesn't necessarily happen suddenly. It, and to some extent, you might already be seeing that in, in the, the data showing movements of, of cropping. So, the transformational change uh, will take, you know, 50, 100 years, you know, it, it will happen very slowly. So it is, it, to some extent, we may already be seeing it. Um, having said that, it's, what's hard is to say what we'll, where we'll end up in 50 years. And it, it's extremely hard to uh, predict what the long run changes in land use are going to be. We don't know what the future climate will be. We don't know uh, what, climate change, what climate change policy will look like. Um, and, and these things will have a big bearing on all of that. So, um, Unfortunately, all we, I, my opinion is that we have to really focus on the, the trends that you're seeing in the short run, because that, that, that's, um, you know, predicting what's going to happen in 50 years is very difficult. And, and you can see, you know, the startings of, of movement in cropping activity. Fascinating hour and a half. Thank you so much for your presentations. Thank you for your questions. Can you please thank them?